wondering if your child has an ear infection or swimmer's ear. Today, we're going to talk about all the differences in the symptoms and how we make a difference in the diagnosis. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Welcome back to Be Kind Pediatrics. For those of you who are new to the show, my name is Dr. Blair Rolnick. I'm a pediatrician and mom. And today, since it's summertime, I wanted to talk about a topic that all of us pediatricians and parents experience all the time, and that is ear infections. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about the difference between the different types of ear infections. So there's actually a middle ear infection, also sometimes called acute otitis media. That's what people are usually referring to when they say bacterial ear infection. And then there's also swimmer's ear, which is actually called acute otitis externa. Um, so we're going to talk about the differences between those two things. And then I want to talk about the difference between acute otitis media and something called otitis media with an effusion, which a lot of parents haven't heard of, but it's really important to make this distinction. Let's, we're going to talk a little bit about why. Then we're going to dive in and talk about who needs antibiotics and who doesn't, who potentially could wait and hold off on the antibiotics. We're going to talk a little tiny bit about who needs ear tubes and who does not need ear tubes and how the duration of antibiotics has changed over the last several decades. So let's jump in and we'll talk about the different types of ear infections to begin with. So let's start off by talking about middle ear infection, which is acute otitis media. When you think about the ear, there's your ear, then there's the external ear canal. That's the part that connects your ear to your eardrum. Then here's your eardrum, also called your tympanic membrane. And past your eardrum on the inside, that's the middle ear. That's where your ear bone lies um, and your, your hearing cells, etc. So when we talk about a middle ear infection, we're talking about an infection that occurs behind the tympanic membrane. And we're talking about swimmer's ear, we're talking about an infection of the external auditory canal. That's the tympanic membrane forward to the external part of your ear. We see both very frequently. Summer's ear is a little bit more frequent this summer. So let's start, start off by talking about summer's ear, what it looks like, um, some of the symptoms and how it's treated. So summer's ear can present with itching, pain, it can also sometimes present with redness or swelling of the earlobe. When it's particularly severe or complicated, you can get systemic symptoms like fever. It's a lot more common in the summer. Um, and there's several reasons for that. So the external part of your ear canal Whenever that gets compromised, it allows bacteria to get in under that skin, and that's how you get an infection there. Um, so we'll start off with pain and itching. Then you'll sometimes see discharge from the ear or a lot of what looks like ear wax, and then you can progress on to fever. The reason we see more of it in the summer is because anything that affects the canal of the ear, like humidity, um, earbuds in the ear, Q-tips in the ear, anything going into the ear at all, swimmers, uh, swimming earplugs can cause a scratch or compromise that skin barrier and allow for an infection to sit in. Same thing with swimming, that's increasing the moisture and humidity, it can cause breakdown of the epithelial layer or the skin layer of the ear and allow for an infection. So how do we treat swimmers ear? We typically treat swimmers ear actually with topical antibiotics plus or minus a steroid. Studies have really shown that compared to oral or systemic antibiotics, topical antibiotics are actually more effective with less side effects than oral antibiotics for swimmer's ear. So really, these should be our first choice. Typically, we're also adding on a steroid or a corticosteroid to that because it reduces the inflammation and can help with symptomatic improvement faster. So a lot of people are using combination of antibiotics and topical steroid drops. It's really important for parents to be aware that when you're putting these drops in, that the child has to lie with the affected ear up and that those drops have to instill for at least 60 seconds before your child sits up. So they really need to be laying down on their side long enough for the drops to have an effect. You can't just drop them in and let them immediately sit up. The other thing that's really important to be aware of is sometimes there's a lot of debris in the ear canal and that can block the drops from getting in. So when that is the case, it's actually recommended that we do an in-office cleaning of the ear or ear lavage to open that up. Sometimes we'll place something called an ear wick to allow the drops to get into the ear and be effective. There are some times where oral antibiotics are needed for some ear. That's when it is a more complicated case. So if there's fever, if there's swelling of the external part of the ear, redness of the external part of the ear, if there's any signs of inflammation in this bone behind the ear, that's called the mastoid, or if the ear 
drum itself, the ear canal is more than 50% occluded. Those are all some indications, among others, to switch from a topical antibiotic to a systemic antibiotic for swimmer's ear. The also important thing to note for swimmer's ear is no swimming for seven days or until the treatment is completed, just because it can allow for a reinfection. So that's swimmer's ear. Now I'm gonna take some time and shift over between uh, middle ear infections or acute otitis media and the differentiating that from a not infectious middle ear pathology called otitis media with an effusion. So the difference between acute otitis media and otitis media with an effusion is that acute otitis media usually is painful, usually there is fever, usually the child is irritable. Otitis media with an effusion can be um, bothersome, it can affect hearing, and it might be painful, but it should not have fever. And the way that we tell the difference is really on physical exam. So when you're looking at the ear, if there are signs of infection like redness or erythema injection, if the eardrum is bulging, those are more indicative of an acute otitis media. Otitis media with effusion means there's no signs of infection, so it's not red, but there is an effusion behind the eardrum. And it's important to make the difference here in distinction on physical exam because otitis media with effusion is not an infection and therefore does not respond to antibiotics. But often we are treating it with antibiotics because the bulging error can look a lot like an acute otitis media, except it lacks those infectious signs. So if you have otitis media with effusion, the treatment is really just watchful waiting. We watch these, they do take a long time to go away, sometimes three plus months. So for the first three months, we're doing all watchful waiting as long as there's no other risk factors. As long as that child doesn't have risk factors for speech or de hearing delay, as long as the hearing is not affected, we're just gonna watch and check again every couple of months to make sure that that effusion has resolved. If there is, an, you know, the hearing is affected or there's risk factors for speech or hearing delay, we usually send those patients over to ENT for possible ear tubes. There's no proof that other adjunct therapies like antibiotics, systemic steroids, um, topical steroids, antihistamines affect the ability of that middle ear effusion to go away faster or to be symptomatically improved. So really there's no role for those additional therapies. If the hearing is affected, again, we usually refer them to EMT. Sometimes the ENT docs will put in ear tubes. If they've had to put in multiple rounds of ear tubes, sometimes they will talk about the role for an abdectomy, but really the vast majority of these children should just be what we call watchful waiting. How does that differ from an acute otitis media? So an acute otitis media, like I said, is usually a really inflamed red ear. There's usually bulging of the TM. And that is treated sometimes with antibiotics. So who needs antibiotics and who does not? This is kind of a shift from in the last, you know, it's really since 2013 and on in treating everybody where we used to treat everybody with antibiotics to only treating a select few. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the change in the landscape of the bacteria that cause ear infections. As we have broadened our coverage for strep pneumococcal from Prevnar 13 or strep 13 vaccines to strep 20 vaccines covering an additional seven strains of pneumococcal, as well as increasing our immunizations against Haemophilus influenza type B. Those were the two leading causes of bacterial ear infections in children. And now as we have vaccines for that, we really are seeing less of those two bacteria and we're seeing more of non-typable H flu and um, more Xella catarrhalis. We used to think a lot of ear infections were viral, but actually the newer studies that came out this year really suggest that the vast majority of these are bacterial and they usually are non-typable H flu or Maroxella. But those two um, bacteria will often go away on their own without the use of antibiotics. So we've talked a ton about the different types of ear infections. I hope you guys found that interesting and empowering. Next week, we're gonna talk about who needs antibiotics and who doesn't. Does everybody need 10 days or so? can some children be treated with less? Um, and are diag improving um, diagnostic capabilities for middle ear infections. Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.